mention the word scooter and you're sure to raise a smile with just about any age group. For 16-year-olds, it's the first step towards the freedom of the open road, while those who've remained at the age of 21 for more years than they care to remember Memories of the swinging 60s, when customised Vespers and Lambrettas were the epitome of cool, will come flooding back. There's something rare about the scooter that is both contemporary and at the same time nostalgic, and this remarkable mode of transport seems to reinvent itself for each new generation of two-wheeled travellers. Scooters are in fact popular the whole world over, particularly in Italy, where the stylish designs of the Vespa and Lambretta originated, transforming this highly practical way of getting from A to B into a veritable fashion icon. And where popular culture led, the rest of the motorcycle industry followed as the scooter revolution quickly gathered momentum. Over the course of the next hour, you'll see the very best of scootering, from the early classics right through to the very latest technological advances, as typified by the Suzuki AN650 Bergman, a machine that without doubt deserves the title Super Scooter. So, without further ado, it's time to hit the road and enjoy a top-notch selection of scooters in action. Hi, my name's Nigel Cox and I've got the world's biggest collection of Lambretta scooters. Uh, let me show you around. Right, this all started I think back in about 1986 when, like everybody, I saw an SX200 which was a scooter that I really wanted and that what uh, started me going. But as we walk around I'll show some of the scooters. This one here, TB175 Series 3, this is a classic scooter with all the mod accessories on it. Um, and this is a sort of era that I remember back in 67, people had the scooters and then you bought bits, mirrors, lights and everything and every spare bit of money you had. Um, moving on to this, another classic scooter, a TB200. This is very nice condition. This is actually done less than 5,000 miles. And it's completely original and I've not seen a nicer one of these. Right, moving on from that, this is still in the 70s now or the late 60s, 70s. We've got the Vega or the Luna range. This is a range of sort of step through scooters. Today they look fairly fashionable, but in the time when they was being sold new, in fact they were sold for 99 pounds. So really, Lambretta lost a lot of money on these scooters. Had they been around now today, I think they may have sold. Now, you'll see two scooters here, the green and the brown one. These are the Model A model or the 125M. This is how Lambretta started. And these were actually designed just after the war. 1944 was a prototype and they actually came onto sale in 1947. And although the scooters have got tiny seven inch wheels, they've got um, a three speed gearbox with a foot gear change, very unusual, it's the only Lambretta that had that. No suspension, they had rubber bushes in the front and the back was just solid and they just relied on the tires. But basically this was just to get people moving after the war, uh, they wanted to get the nation rolling again and this is what happened. You had Piaggio, which was about six months before them in 1946, had already got a scooter, and this is what Lambretta came back. Um, like everything, anything new, they didn't keep this model for very long. In 1948, they bought out the B model. Similar looking scooter, although many, many things are different. You upgraded to eight inch wheels. You now had um, a hand gear change like all the other Lambretta scooters. You had suspension now. You had suspension on the front, which was cantilever and you had a torsion arm suspension or a, a bush suspension on the rear. Uh, all these are 125cc scooters, top speed of 40, 45 mile an hour. Here I am with Vittorio, who's given me a sneak preview of the new museum that will be open in a week. We're very privileged and he's also here to help me if I make any mistakes and to point them out to me. This is a 1969, 1970 J125 Super Starstream. 
It has a false horn casting here, a turning front mudguard, more closely trying to resemble the Vespa, I guess. Two-tone paintwork, had an awful lot of money spent on the advertising campaign to try and get it to sell. Not many machines were actually built, but this is a fantastic example of one. This was the last in the line for the J-Range series. Cento 100, done in a lovely ivory. Is this paintwork original? Original piece. Original paintwork, lovely shine for original paintwork. Not perfect, but very good enough. The handling on these isn't particularly good. Was it the steering is very light. The steering head bearings are really small on them and they're fiddly. Getting the cables through the frame is, that's an advantage of a Lambretto. It shouldn't be a disadvantage, which you get with the J-Ranges. What we have here is a cutaway. These machines were actually used for publicity purposes back in, well, when the vehicles were being produced in order for people to be able to see how they worked and how they've been put together. A lot of, hey, it all turns over, look at that. If we can get the camera in here, we can, sorry, no, no gasoline. There's no petrol in it, no petrol. but we can get an idea as to how the engine runs. Piston up and down here, vertically obviously, rather than forwards and back. We've got the clutch here, the gearbox, the kickstart mechanism, LD kickstarts, not my favourite. No, <laughs> nobody's favourite. <laughs> and the shaft drive, no chain on here, and you can see the shaft in the centre here. Here we have a beautiful 1947 Model A Lambretta. Foot gear change, nice bare handlebars. That will tell you straight away it's an A and not a Model B, which we have next door. Absolutely beautiful machine, this one. You've got the gear selector up here. If we have a look in here, we've got first, second, third. As you twist, this indicator moves up and down. Same frame, but something that's been introduced to this one is the rear suspension. If we look down here, this is our suspension. Other differences, we've obviously got the gear selector box here. Now this one stayed the same and was carried through over onto the early Model C's and LC's. Nice machine. In this sort of condition, this sort of original condition is really rare and a real privilege to have a look at. And if it wasn't for machines like this, you wouldn't actually have a guide in order to be able to restore these in the future. Just little things. Were things zinc plated, nickel plated, nuts, bolts? Fantastic. The front wheel here was also enlarged from a seven inch to an eight inch wheel and was held in place by the front mudguard rather than what we would know as an ordinary set of Lambretta forks where the wheel would be bolted in tightly into two links on either side. At the moment we're driving down the Napoleonic Grand Corniche and we're about 15-20 minutes away from Italy where just over the frontier we've been tipped off that there's a small auto jumble. Hopefully there's going to be loads of interesting parts there and probably a couple of bikes as well. You never know. There could be loads, there could be nothing. It's a chance you take. We can't get our hopes up too much. In all my visits to Italy, I've never actually seen a Lambretta riding down the road. It's more of a historical phenomena, but a phenomena nevertheless. And the passion for it is still alive. With any luck, we'll be able to find the remnants of a once thriving culture. You've got to remember this. 30, 40 different types of Lambretta and Vespa. You're not going to find everything that you look was at your want in one stall. But you can find one bit. You might not find anything that you're after. But the great thing about these Italian auto jumbles is that you've got more stalls over here and more stalls over the other side. They're great. For people who really, well, who really are serious about the restorations of their bikes and want original pieces, these are, these are the places to come.
Now this is a bit of a find, not much of a find, but a bit of a find. This is obviously an LD125, it's a Mark III B. Well, you can tell that, you look at the cowlings on the handlebars, the only other ones to have cowlings as standard were going to be the Mark IV French LD. Slightly different design on the ferrule, was it the horn casting slightly different, no badges there. But um, this is a generally, generally a pretty complete bike, it's okay. The mudguard's dented around, try and find an mud, LD mudguard that isn't, it's a bit of a pain in the ass. You buy something like this, you're going to expect it. It is a rare old gem and it's the sort of thing that in a few years time you're not going to find any of at all. So if they're there, you've really got a bit of a historic duty really to try and get it and try and preserve it. Grazie signore. Perfecto. Amazing. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. I've been looking for one of these. It's a Luna 50 headlamp rim all over England. I've had no luck whatsoever. I just strolled up to a store. Here it is, problem over, job done, I've still got change. Fantastic. Oh, oh wow. Got a Lambretta Series 2 here. Now this is the first bike I ever owned and I think they're absolutely fantastic. First thing that attracts me to this one, the fact that it looks straight, it's clean, the mud guard isn't bent around. You've got this nice little sort of stripy, tutti frutti, handy leg shield rubbers. Um, you've got a floor mat on there. Well, everything's reasonably solid. It's complete, it's had a blowover. You could be forgiven. You look at this and you think, well, well it looks all very original. That must be worth a packet. Well, reality is it costs a packet, but it isn't original paintwork. Things you look for, like the bolts here on top of the forks, they've been painted. Little bits of overspray on the running strips here. This is pretty much your bog standard model. Produced between 1959, 1961. Very popular here, very popular in England. Now this is interesting. This is the size of the wheels, a seven inch wheel from a Model A. Comparata qui? Yeah. Questa mattina? Si? Questa mañana? Wow. Now this was bought in the morning. This is a, a 350 by 7 tyre. Only myself and people like myself <laughs> think this is incredible. <laughs> now, the end of the day. It's getting a bit chilly now. We've put an extra layer of clothing on. It's worth hanging around and carrying on because you don't never know. Another five minutes, I might find that carburetor for my GS. I may find a light switch for my Model B. You never, ever, ever know what you're going to find in these things. Here I have an exhaust for my Luna 50. Brand spankers go straight on there. I'm really chuffed with that. I've got a rather tatty exhaust for my Model LC here, but I need one. It only costs a couple of quid, and I can get the thing on the road now. That's absolutely amazing. As far as I'm concerned, this is a great day out. When I got my first Lambretta at the age of 15, and I started restoring it, and got it ready for my 16th birthday, a Lambretta Comita registered dodgily as a 50cc. I'm sure anyone in England will understand. I never thought that 18 years on, I'd be driving to the very factory where it was built. It's funny that I'm feeling emotional about this. It should be just a factory. But one thing's for sure, I'm really excited about it. <laughs> We're outside one of only four remaining buildings at the old Innocenti plant. This is the main gate, an office area. Mixed feelings now. It's exciting to be here, but it's also rather sad when you look at the state of the building now. You can imagine painters, polishers, assembly plant workers, cleaners, chromers, everyone flooding through these gates, dispersing throughout the whole of the Milan. It's just a shame that something like this factory that built motorcycles that for certainly for me and for many other people as well brought so much fun and so much happiness 
those darker adolescent moments. You just go outside and you go and work on your lambretta. Those joyous moments, the meeting a new girl and taking her out on your bike. She might not have cared. She might not have known what she was on, but you did. And all throughout my life, certainly, if I've had long hair, short hair, dreadlocks, Mohicans, as an accountant, as a foreign student, I've always had a Lambretta. It started off being a mod and, and then of course you couldn't have a motorbike because that wouldn't be mod, would it? So, you know, I just went with that, that scene with a scooter and um, they were quite cheap to buy. You could buy a second-hand one. <clears throat> so, you know, a friend of mine, um, he bought a brand new GS with the chrome bubbles and racks and everything and um, he paid some serious money for it, you know, and uh, he must have uh, had a reasonable good pay to be able to buy that, you know, and, and run that. <clears throat> but he had whitey baldy tyres and everything on it, you know, we thought this was like a Rolls Royce, I mean, I remember when he pulled up on it, it was an absolutely amazing thing. So metallic dark blue, everything chrome, racks, white, white wall tyres, wheel trims, you name it, he had it like, you know. And uh, it, was, it was us, well, it was like my £40 scooter, you know, <laughs> which was quite satisfying in a way because I'd done it all myself, you know, rebuilt it, you know, what needed doing, knew every nut and bolt on it. You know, we used to, and it was so reliable. And you could, I used to carry a certain amount of spares, you know, that uh, I could fix on the side of the road, you know, like cables and, and, you know, I was a bit of a boy scout like that, you know, I sort of always prepared for breakdowns, like, which they very rarely did, you know, they very rarely did. They were very, very reliable, you know, and uh, we sort of set off all over the place on them with the, the knowledge usually that we were going to get there and back somehow, you know. It was, it was brilliant. We used to just drift out of London and uh, there was times when I actually left uh, North London, you know, about six or seven of us. And the time we crossed Foxhall Bridge and going out the other side of London, there'd be, be 50, 100 or uh, hundreds of us. We used to be just across the road, you know, and nobody would bother with you because there were too many of us. <laughs> and uh, times when I, we, were going, uh, we were going down to, I think it was Margate one year, on the outskirts of Margate, I remember mean, coming up to a junction about four or five of us, and these uh, rockers or greasers we used to call them at the time in the motorcycle, and uh, one with a sidecar. And uh, they sort of sh shouted as we went past. The next thing I looked behind, and this one stood up in the sidecar, seat, <laughs> swinging a big bicycle chain, <laughs> and actually chased us. I think my scooter had never gone so fast in his life. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, it was just amazing things like that happening all the time. Like this, this com conflict, you know, conflict with the, uh, the, the rockers and the mods. Thank God, though, nobody I know personally got really injured, you know. Had the usual run ins with the rockers, but that was mainly hyped up, you know, and things like that. So, but in general, it's brilliant. It was the first time, really, that young people had had the mobility um, for, 
for, the, uh, for low, low cost, you know. I mean, we, we, you could buy a scooter at quite a reasonable price and be f fully mobile, as I said, you know, and, and it and become a sort of a way of life, you know. Um, well, they used to call them scooter boys, didn't they? But, um, you know, you could take a girl out in the back, you know, and, you know, you had, to, you had that freedom, didn't you? You know, the, to do things and to go places that you would never have gone, really, unless you caught the train or... Or, um, I know we lived in London, so it was lovely to get out of London. And you know, I remember when I, f I mean, silly thing like that. I, I first, I first had my scooter. I, I won some money in work on a, um, on a, uh, one of these tote things, and I was only, I was 16, and it was only like 15 quid. And I remember giving my mother an extra fiver housekeeping, and taking my mate up to the pub out in the country, and we had a, a nice ploughman's, but we had the freedom to do it because we had the scooter. I wouldn't have been able to do that if I hadn't had the scooter. You know, it was absolutely amazing. In them days, it was transport, my, my way to work, recording days, you know, and uh, today it's just an hobby. It was a Lambert a Jet 200, 1977. I bought it for 30 quid off an RAF bloke that had been posted to, posted abroad anyway. And uh, I got it, it was about a year and a half old. Uh, first time, first time I fell off it. <laughs> <laughs> it was about 20 minutes after I got it. <laughs> to run straight to the back of the car. So, I wasn't happy. £25 a week, I worked eight weeks for it. £200 pay for Lambert, GP 200 Um But 1978, was the first time I saw a scooter, that was in Telford. It was uh, a Vespa 50. Wasn't much to look at, but it's, first, it's my first recollection of a scooter. Yeah, I was uh, 16, just bought a brand new Vespa, well, say about six months old, PK50, rough old thing. Yeah. Um, there was a lad in town I used to see dressed up as a skinhead, skunking around town, you'd be like, oh, hello, young man. And um, I think he had a Lambretta or some description, I didn't have a clue what it was at the time, but he took me to Margate 92, I think, because I was quite a late starter, and um, that was it. Wanted my own straight away. Didn't want to go on no, the back of no man's bike. <laughs> yeah, it was the first time. Uh, I bought it off a friend who had had it from there. It wasn't very old, but it, you know, it's, in, it's in a few wars, so to speak. And uh, good fun. Enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, that was it, really. You get on one and that's it. You're bitten by the bug. So you find out everyone else you've got one and they take you to the rally and you get your own and then it goes on from there. Yeah, I was about... Eight years of age, cousins in Southampton, Ian and Kevin, one was a mod, one was a skinhead. And um, just like, they influenced me a lot. My brother, who's a few years older than me, he got into it. And he started taking me on the rallies when I was uh, 12, 1982, Colwyn Bay, North Wales. Um, and it just went from there, really. My first scooter was 16. And um, I'm 30 now, and just been into them ever since. Me and my mum were walking down the seafront. I, I was said to her, what are those mum? And she went, they're your bows. And I thought, I want to be one, basically. <laughs> that was it. But, and the first time I started riding scooters was 79. And I'm now 40, so I've been into it a fair bit. First scooter I ever had, had an old LI150. It cost me 50 quid. It didn't run very well, but it cost me 50 quid. Yeah, 1977, just before Quadrophenia bloke. All my mates were going to Northern Sol Wigan and taking scooters. And they convinced me to buy one to go with them. And, and have you ever looked back? Never. But I wish I was 17 again. <laughs> that is for sure. Oh, fashion, it was fantastic, yeah. Well, first of all, we started wearing parkas from the Army and Serbia store, the American. And if you could get them with the badges and the stripes on, which usually they removed before they sold them, or well, bullet hole in it or something. <laughs> but, um, and then, uh, of course, that was nice to put over the top, you know, and uh, we didn't have to wear crash helmets, so headgear was optional, which I had a nice trilby, which I got from Dunn's, and uh, weathered, all nicely weathered, and uh, used to pull down over, the, over my head like that to keep it on. Um, and as I said before, we were getting into suits a lot, I had a lovely full-length leather, cherry-coloured leather jacket, uh, coat, which is a little 
pretty cool on the scooter, you know. And the women were quite impressed, you know. Which we had, you could have to wear all the time, if we put it down anyway, it was stolen. <laughs> you know, you couldn't go to a party and not take your coat off. It's, you know, we've been to parties and we go there and take our coats off, put them on somebody's bed upstairs, and go upstairs and somebody had been up there and chucked them all out the window and it'd all be gone, like, you know? so everybody wore their coat all the time, like, you know. When it all first started, it used to be the mods and all that sort of thing and the skinheads and that lot. But it's gone more to just scooterists now. They don't class themselves with mods as in a way. You get some that still are traditional mods, but most of them are just fanatical scooterists and that. But they all follow a trend of style like the skinhead scene and all that lot. But me, I like to keep to the tradition of my mod scene and that. And um, basically just enjoy it. Oh, the music and the fashion is a big part of the scene and it does play a very big part of us. So, you know, the fashion is excellent at the minute and the, and the music is. I'm into the music, not so much the clothes. I wear the Fred Perry tops and the jeans and the Harringtons, but it's not an everyday thing for me. I just wear it when I'm on a rally. There's always been relationships through music and scootering. Different types of music, different music for different folks, you know. Everybody's different. I, I DJ house music as well as listen to Northern Soul. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm really, I listen to everything really. Uh, I think a lot of people just listen to the, to the ska and the Northern Soul, but I think it, it, uh, it appeals to everyone. I mean, you can, you can listen to rock music really hard. Rock music is still like scooters. To start with, people tended to copy each other a lot, you know? I mean, even down to having different coloured shoelaces, different coloured socks, it started off a bit silly like that. And then it started, uh, people started to get their own individual styles. And, and as I said, I used to go to have my suits. I, one time I had nearly seven suits, you know, and which I, once as soon as I paid for one, I'd have another one I was putting five shillings away a week for. And the last one I had made uh, the 14 inch pleat in the jacket, massive pockets on there, you know. And um, always have to buy Revell shoes to match, you know, and socks had to match, you know, and everything had to match. I had my hair cut every week. You know, it didn't have to be a hair out of place, it was sort of like a number two or whatever, all over. Much to my mother's uh, disgust, she wouldn't even talk to me in the street, she thought like a little convict. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was just uh, being young and having fun, you know. This is a French LD here. Now, well, I sprayed all this myself many, many years ago. It's a bit of a mess now, but I bought it for £60. And this goes to show what you can do with a bit of determination. I mean, this is a roadworthy machine. It's great fun to ride. It's not fast, but for maybe 260 now with the paint and a few bits, it's very good value for money. It will never depreciate. And it's a bit of old mo bit of motoring history. Right, now this is my garden. Now, as a scooter dealer, I have to suffer having a garden like this. So I hope the customers appreciate all of this. What I'd really like is a pond with loads of pot plants and it'll be fantastic, but no, my garden's full of scooters. This one though, well, is it I quite like. This is the first one I ever, ever bought when I was 14 and I've kept hold of it for all these years. It's a TV175 Series 2 and when I first bought it when I was 14 years old, it cost me £40. The same sort of bike now in this condition is easily worth £2,000. But even though it sounds excessive, it's never going to go down in value. Or well, you have got no depreciation. Or well, it's just going to keep on going and going and going, giving you 100 miles per, per gallon and a lot of fun. It's got to be better than one of these new bikes. This is a good example of why it's good fun being a scooter dealer. Because this one I've actually sold to a friend of mine called Stevie. Or well, I sold it for £900. It's covered in fingerprints because we had to put it through the MOT. But Stevie's a 17-year-old lad who really loves an old Lambretta. It's all been fully rebuilt, 900 quid. That's half the price of a 50cc twist and go that's only going to last you a few years. It's got to be good value for money, and he absolutely loves it. But I really ought to get on and finish it, because he's been waiting a while. That was a nice bike. This is not. Beware, do never, never buy a Lambretta that looks like this. You might think 600 quid, what an absolute bargain. Everything that could be wrong on it is wrong on it. I have spent about a week trying to get this thing running and I know these things like the back of my hand. I could strip an engine down blindfold and 
this one just defies all logic. Everything that could be wrong is wrong. If you're gonna buy an old Lambretta, make sure that it runs really, really well. Don't be scared of spending an extra few hundred quid on it. You really will get value for money at the end of the day. If you buy one with the engine rebuilt, all night, the, the parts are nice and cheap, but if it's done properly, you can pick yourself up a bargain. It's just a way of life. It isn't just about owning a scooter. It's just a lifestyle you adopt. You get excited when Scooter Magazine comes out because you might be in it. And then you cringe because you think, what was I up to at the last rally? It's just, every rally you go to, you can meet your old mates and they introduce you to their new mates and you just make so many friends, so many, at so many rallies. And it's just like a family. I mean, I'm traveling the world in a couple of months and I'm hoping to link it up with all the rallies around the world, and all you've got to do is email someone and say, I'm, I'm coming over, and you've instantly got another set of mates. Although you've never met them before because you've got a scooter, they'll have a scooter, and you'll be accepted. But it's just it's just the people you meet, basically. It's a good way of life. You cannot beat scootering. A way of ever. life. Ever, ever. It is, it's a way of life. It's a way of life, and I won't change. No, we'll never change. Never change. I've got it tattooed in my arm. That's how far, far we'll go. Look, seven side lines, all the way. Always. Scooters. What part could you be? Life, what be could you be? Since I was 16, it's been part of my life and it'll always be there. It's in there, isn't it? Yeah. Fun. Good fun. Basically, good fun and, you know, that's it for me, man. Enjoy it. You know. I treat more as a way of life. I mean, it's, it's a regular thing for me. I regularly use my scooter all the time, back and forth to work and that. So it's, uh, it's a regular way of life for me. Basically, my daughter's getting into the scene as well now. She's nine, so I've started her off as well now and uh, buy her t-shirts and stuff, so get her a scooter when she gets old enough. So yeah, it's a way of life for me. Right, a train. It may seem a bit of a strange place to start a story about a Vespa. But it's taking us to the airport, where we're going to jump on a plane and we're going to fly down to Italy and show you what it's all about but to save you all the rubbish of airports. Here we are. We're just approaching Pontedera and the hallow territory of the Vespa factory. It's a very exciting experience. I, I can't I can't believe we're actually going to be here. Pontedera started producing Vespa scooters in April of 1946 and has constantly and consistently been throwing out the best scooters in the world for the last 56 years. A testimony to the incredible history of the Vespa scooter. Fialia Rinaldo Piaggio. I guess we must almost be there. Here I am in Piaggio Street. I have Piaggio behind me. I have Piaggio to my right, to my left, as far as the eye can see. We've got Vespers being loaded up onto trucks now. This is where it all began. This is where it carried on. This is where it is happening now. And goodness knows when it's gonna stop. This is really exciting. Let's go. Here we go. I'm really excited and you're gonna be excited too. This is the heart of Vespa. This is the Mecca, the temple, the everything. There is nothing here that you could want for. Here we have the whole story and it starts right here. The very first prototype, the Paparino, the Donald Duck. Absolutely amazing little machine, a new design. Piaggio was looking, were looking for a way of moving away from aircraft design. Aircraft engines were very expensive to build. Nobody really wanted to buy them in the post-war post economies. This was the first idea. We noticed we've got a bicycle pump here, pressed steel construction. This was Piaggio's baby, the pressed steel construction. This, however, was thrown back, obviously because it did look like Donald Duck and was a particularly ugly machine and didn't handle at all. The, the job of redesigning was given to an aircraft designer who came up with this. Now this design was taken on board. And this was totally revolutionary. If we look here, we've got the front fork set up. 
Now, this wasn't really to change too much up until the present day. Refined, certainly, and a lot better. But the whole idea of actually having almost this aircraft landing gear type setup with the wheel that could just be taken off was absolutely fantastic. Air cooling through the side panels here. Well, that was something that was done away with as well. But we have, the, we have the precursors here. We have little aluminium floor strips here, which we're going to be repeated in later models, which we'll get to a little later. But certainly, the whole concept of Vespa was there right from the start. Now, this is what you could call a case history of Vespa. From the beginning, a 1951 Vespa 125. The interesting thing about this is that the rod gear change mechanism was changed for two flexible cables, still in use to today. Vespa ET3 Primavera, 1976. Lovely model, electronic ignitions, very fast, fantastic. 1953 Vespa 125U, this was the economy model. We have screwed on side panels here, just like the very first of the Vespa 98s of April 46. We've got very little chrome on there, no rubber inserts on the strips, just plain aluminium as we saw on the Ape earlier on. Here, we've got a Vespa 150. This is the second year of production of the rotary valve engine and uh, the rotary valve induction system improved reliability and performance all round and is still in use to the present day. We've got another Vespa ET3. We've got the unique Vespa 125 circuit of 1948. This is absolutely unique. There's nothing like this anywhere else in the world. Never was, never will be. Now, find the refinements that you find here is a completely redesigned front hub. We've got a, a different suspension set up here. It's like a little extra. It's the sort of thing that you find on 1950s motorcycles that can be adjusted to strengthen, loosen, do whatever you like. There's also one of these on the engine inside here that we won't be able to see. The carburetor looks like it's a 30 God knows what millimeter carburetor with strange filters, tubes. The handlebar set up here seems to be a stack of handlebar joints. I have no idea why anyone ever thought that that was a good idea, but it's here and it's now and it's in front of us. <laughs> this is just absolutely incredible. We have a reinforced frame, we have specially made panels, a molded in petrol tank, and this huge, great, hoofing, great trumpet of a straight through exhaust. Absolutely awesome, terrifying machine. And if you were to take this on the road in England, I'd give you five minutes before you lost your license. We're screaming down a 200 year old road along the Côte d'Azur. Just, just over the border in Italy, we've got a small little auto jumble where if we don't find any Vespers, I'll eat my hat. They're everywhere, the country's obsessed with them. It's a passion, a passion the like of which I haven't found anywhere else in the world. Not even England, it's different. It's different here. It's more, it's more family orientated maybe. This is what I love about these sort of auto jumbles. You've got old Mercedes, you've got people who are into Lambrettas talking to people with motor guzzies. Well, you've got people with motor guzzies trying to sell their Vespas to other people. Everyone just has a really jolly time and just trades stuff about. Was well, it selling this and selling that? But the reason was that we're, was it that I'm here now is because of scooters. And here we go. This one. This one, I guess, will be a 1954 Vespa 125. Absolutely incredible. You'll tell that it's a 125. We've got gear cables here. Was it? This was introduced in about 1952. Was it? And was a great improvement on the old rod, rod mechanism, which didn't really function particularly well. Was it little extras that weren't fitted as standard? It would be things like a speedo here. Now this little speedo with the Vespa logo on it is really, re really very round. It's a lovely little extra if you're going to restore a bike. Was it? This is the sort of thing that you really want to put on there, and is as rare as hen's teeth. You just don't find them anymore. You look at the wider frame. Was it? You look inside here. We've got the toolbox there with the carburetor inside it. Absolutely incredible machines, and with the headlamp low. Now this machine was produced in England by Douglas, but because of legal reg regulations, the headlamp had to be moved up to here. This one would have been known as a GL or a GL2. This one next to it is a Series 1 GS160. 
Now, yeah, if you're watching this, you'll be thinking, great, I'd love this machine, but it is really very expensive. And Italy isn't the sort of place to buy these things anymore. You're talking about 1,200 pounds for something like this. It's complete, but you can get that sort of deal in England. Sometimes you're better off actually buying one that's already restored for a couple of thousand pounds. It's going to cost you 800 to do one anyway, but this is a lovely example to find. And more importantly, a lot of the British models was that you find they're rusted out underneath with the weather. You come to Italy and you do find the rust-free examples. Things to look out for here. Straight mud guards, straight leg shields. Well, so you look at the switch here and that automatically tells you straight away that it's a GS160. The classic mod bubbles at the back, was well, it looked great in chrome in the 1960s. And um, in about 19, this is about a 1962 model. And in 1962, you had all the mods riding around up and down the seafronts, fighting with the bikers and doing their things. And they were getting there on things like this. Cheap, affordable transport. A pair of splint, sprint veloces. Absolutely fantastic machines. Was it a step up from the GL that we saw earlier? Was it these ones have got triple transfer ports? Was it means that the miles per gallon goes down but the speed is about 20 kilometers per hour more? Absolutely fantastic. These will be about late 1960s. This one's slightly earlier because it has the trapezoidal headlamp on there. This one, the later one, we've got the rally, was it the rally headlamp on there? Nice big headlamp, plenty of light, can see where you're going, makes a change, certainly a, a step in the right direction. This is a lovely engine sound. The guy who owns this bike's just come over, second kick, she starts up, she ticks over, there's no mucking about. You don't have to worry about oil seals or anything like that. A lot of the people you meet at these jumbles are all, all old faces. You find them all over the place and they're always pleased to see you. you get invited back to people's houses, offer bowls of wine and stuff like that. It's fantastic. It's great fun, mate. I just love it out here. It's the next day, we've got about half an hour before we get to Rimini and the Italian National Motorcycle Museum where there's another auto jumble going on. Here we are at another auto jumble and the first thing I find when I get in here is the most amazing collection of Vespa literature. We've got brand new, the brand new Vespa Technica manuals over here, which is just absolutely incredible and amazing. And I, I just, and other stuff, you've got so much literature here. Was it, you've got Vespa from Milan to Tokyo, a little travel documentary, the workshop manuals, illustrated histories, a couple of the books are in English, most of them are in Italian. It really is worth learning in Italian. I actually learnt my Italian from a, from a workshop, an Italian workshop manual, and it's fantastic. Ask me how to ask for a cup of tea, I wouldn't know. Ask me the name for a, a primary drive cog, and I'll be able to tell you. This is a 1954-55 Vespa 125. Oh, it's absolutely fantastic. Really nicely done. Good solid paintwork on there. A few little odds and sods. The horn's not right on it. You got gear cables, which is an important thing. That was. That makes life a lot easier. You've got this strange pillion seat on the back. Was it in Italy? It was because it was a little bit naughty, was it, to sit, or a bit dirty, to sit astride a motorcycle. So you sat on these side saddle, and we generally have a little plate along here, was it, for the, your wife to put her feet on. This is a 1952 Vespa 125. It looks, it's covered in rust, but a lot of it is surface rust. Now, this is the sort of bike I would go for. You can end up paying two or three times more for something that's still got a solid layer of paint on it, and its cable's a bit more complete, the brakes work and stuff like that. But if you're looking for a restoration, then that doesn't really matter. It's all gonna have to be stripped down anyway. It's all gonna have to be shot blasted. All the cables are gonna have to be replaced. The stuff, like the headlamp, you don't really need. The problem with this one is the fact it doesn't have a seat. Now, if you're going to an Italian auto jumble, you will find a seat. If you had this in England, it would be a complete and utter nightmare. Now, this is similar to the rod type we saw yesterday at the auto jumble. And it's got an awkward engine. The engine doesn't turn over. This one is seized. They can be a right pain in the ass. Starting with one of these engines, a bit of a mystery, difficult to get bits for. Seized engine, missing the cowling, lovely side panel. I missed that one. Completely cut away. Definitely a 52 model. Absolutely fantastic. Rear light's missing. But you can buy the rear light, you can buy the front light, it all comes new. You get all the reproduction parts. The stand's all bent and knackered, it's probably the brackets underneath, but they can be bent back. Was it the brake pedal's probably seized? 
it's not. What a bonus. In fact, cast iron brake pedal, that's interesting. I didn't realise they had them. Overall, if you were looking for a bike to restore, this is the sort of thing you should be going for. Was it buy something cheaper? Don't bother buying a bike that's going to be halfway decent already. Buy something with the bare bolts because that's all you need to start a restoration. Absolutely incredible. Let's have a look. Let's see if it's got all its bits and bobs. Side panel cl clips are missing, but that doesn't really matter. They're only little strips of metal. You could make them yourself unless, unless you can get hold of a proper set. Separate rear suspension back here is a nice little touch while we've got the side panel up. Just inside here, you haven't got your integrated unit that came in a couple of years later. No coil, straight out of the magneto. Nice little bike. I'll be tempted to do this myself. I love these sort of machines and collectors love these sort of machines, but they're just not popular in Britain. It's a shame that they're not because there are still plenty of this sort of thing to get hold of. Absolutely amazing. Another little thing to check with these. Tiny little petrol tank, isn't it? It's great. Put your hand around inside the tank. A little bit rusty, but this is generally a clean bike. Appearances, is de appearances are deceptive. This is your perfect restoration bike if you want to buy one to restore. Somebody used this, was it back in the 1950s, to go to parties, to get to work, to do their job, to get on, to mobilise Italy. Italy was saved by these. This very model. That's outrageous, isn't it, really, at the end of the day. Well worth getting hold of and well worth restoring. And I wish, was it, I wish they were more popular in England. I really do. I see Lambrettas all day long. The old Vespers, well worthy. Look, the way they're put together, the way the frame, was it, frame pressings go together, the design hasn't really changed that much in 50, 50, 60 years. It's incredible. What a design feat. I've just been led to Vespa, a 1959 Vespa, and we're just about to go round town. This is what it's all about. What an absolute scream! There we go, a hairpin dead. Watch how the Vespa takes it in its stride. That's it for us now. We've been everywhere. We've been to the factory, we've been to the museum, we've been to the auto jumbles, we've discovered these things in garages, we've ridden up mountains, down mountains, two bars, we have done everything. But at the end of the day, this is what it is all about. It's friendship, having fun, riding around, and having a drink at the end of the day. Now, it's a real shame but this is the end of our Vespa quest, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I have. Let's go, Guinness. <laughs>
and unmistakable styling blends together to create a whole new hybrid. The power behind the Bergman 650 comes from a 638cc V-twin engine that's centrally located, motorcycle style, for optimum weight distribution and handling. With plenty of power from the engine throughout its speed range, it's got the ability to leave a four-wheeled vehicle behind at the traffic lights. The Bergman 650 has three separate modes of drive, each available at a flick of your left thumb by a sophisticated transmission system. The Suzuki Electronic Constantly Variable Transmission is the first of its type ever developed for a scooter. Three different modes of operation are on offer to you and your left thumb. Normal Automatic, Power Automatic and 5-speed Manual. If you select Power Mode, the engine picks up and delivers a bit of a kick. Finally, select Manual Mode and you can manually shift up and down the five gears for motorcycle-like control. With the largest displacement engine in its class, this super scooter offers both low and mid-range cruising power, ideal for two-up touring. The 638cc twin-cylinder four-stroke liquid-cooled engine has dual counterbalance shafts to minimise vibration. Surrounding the twin-cylinder heart is a tubular steel frame designed with strength and agility in mind. The top speed is well above the legal limit, therefore it's very easy to overtake safely. The scooter carries its weight easily due to the low centre of gravity and has perfect low speed control for getting through crowded town centres. The telescopic front forks provide easy wheel travel for sport performance and a comfortable ride, whilst the stainless steel exhaust system provides quiet operation, featuring a chrome muffler end cap for high heat resistance and improved appearance. The rear suspension of the Suzuki AN650 Bergman features twin preload adjustable shock absorbers and a separate aluminium swing arm which, in turn, allows optimum engine placement and forward weight distribution. As mentioned previously, the scooter borrows from the big brother world of motorcycle technology. In this case, the borrowing is of an advanced fuel injection system that features a computerised engine management system, or ECM for short, which helps to lower emissions. The oxygen feedback system, with a catalytic converter attached, adds to the achievement of the combustion chamber, getting an efficient air-fuel mix. The Suzuki Bergman AN650 has been praised because of this environmentally friendly engine system as the emissions fall well below the European requirements. The instrument panel is very much like your average car, with its large and easy to read digital LCD display. Housed within the panel are a speedometer, an odometer, a trip meter, a rev counter, a water temperature meter, a fuel level meter, a clock and key indicator lights. The storage space is a treasure chest of 56 litres under the seat. It'll hold up to two full-face motorcycle helmets with room to spare. At the front of the scooter, three small compartments underneath the handlebars provide storage for valuables and essentials, with the main compartment being lockable for safety. The main compartment also contains a DC outlet to allow you to recharge your mobile phone whilst riding. And it's whilst riding that you realise an added bonus to the scooter's performance is the comfortable riding position on an ultra-soft saddle. The low seat height and supportive moulding of the saddle adds comfort to any long journey and it's got an adjustable backrest too. In fact, the high level of comfort is matched with the seductive way the scooter looks. Trim and stylish. It has a front fairing that combines a protective windscreen, integrated rear-view mirrors, 
multi-reflector headlights and floorboards that are elegantly disposed of for problem-free stops and easy foot placement. It also boasts flush-mounted front turn signals and a large combination tail light and brake light. As the press release for this super scooter so succinctly put it, every so often there comes a machine so far advanced that it redefines a category. The Suzuki AN650 Bergman is just such a machine, capable of comfortable cruising at highway speeds, responsive, sporty and fun. That is the Suzuki style. And that truly does say it all. <laughs>